All right, the new bike party is not stopping, and right now we've got the Yeti SB165. This has been updated for 2024 with new geometry, new suspension, and a mixed wheel setup. It departs a little bit from what I've come to know about how most Yetis ride, but in a really good way for the category. So stick around to see what it's all about. Couple of details for context before we go ride. Obviously this has 165 millimeters of rear wheel travel, 170 up front. You'd better like coil shocks because that's what you're getting on this bike. And that alone should show you the intended use or the intentions of this bike. It's big, it's burly, it's made to go big, or in my case, exceptionally medium. I do have a small bone to pick. This is a 165 millimeter travel bike. It's heavy, it's burly, arguably made for going downhill, yet it comes with paper thin EXO plus tire casings. I get it, yet he's probably trying to appease a bunch of folks who are better at counting grams than Pablo Escobar. So I guess you can't really blame them when the market demands it. That said, I would really like to see this come with a double down or DH casings and or tire inserts, even if it means the weight doesn't look quite as pretty on paper. All right, bone picked, let's get into it. Uphill performance. Obviously this is a big, heavy, burly bike, yet it's a little bit surprising how well it goes uphill. It is surprisingly pleasant to pedal to the top of a mountain, and it's efficient enough to not just be a complete soul sucker on the way up. It is definitely not a trail bike, still an enduro bike, but for the category, I'd say it's probably one of the better climbers. Yeti typically tunes their suspension to pedal pretty well. The SB160 is a good climber for its category, the SB140, again, and so on down the line. And this SB165 is no exception. It is pretty efficient for a big bike, yet it still offers the traction and comfort and control you'd expect out of a big bike. In fact, as far as Yeti goes, I think this accomplishes that task the best. It has a little bit more relaxed feel to it than most of Yeti's other models. I think it comes down to the suspension design and the geometry, but namely the suspension is a bit more forgiving and active, which is really helpful on those steep, bumpy, and loose climbs. So in addition to that suspension, the geometry is a little bit more relaxed. The front end sits up a little bit higher and the reach is a little bit shorter, giving the bike an overall more upright and comfortable fit. So compared to most other XL Yeti frames that have been released recently, minus the ASR, that one's kind of weird, it's a cross country bike, it is about five millimeters shorter. And this has the tallest stack height of any Yeti bike in the current lineup. And those two factors combined make a pretty big difference in the seated position making it more relaxed and comfortable. At 439 millimeters, the chainstays are on the shorter end for a big bike these days. That does make sense given that this is a mixed wheel setup and you're not getting the full benefit of a 27.5 rear wheel if you don't also have shorter chainstays. But yes, it is a little bit short, contributes a lot to the handling, which is very nice. And it's not so short that I felt like I was falling off the back of the bike or that I had any really negative effects from it. Mullet benefits mostly show up on the downhill. It does have a benefit on the climbs as well. Given you're on the same bike and the same gearing, that smaller back wheel is going to be easier to spin up than a 29 inch back wheel. And for me, that comes into play on steep and techie climbs as well as on tight switchbacks. So when you're in tight terrain and just can't momentum your way up the climb, the smaller rear wheel is pretty nice to have. It's quicker to get spinning and consequently you can get back up to speed easier as you move up a ledge or around an obstacle. And the same holds true for tight uphill switchbacks come around the corner, get the bike straightened out, get back on the gas, and you get back up to speed a little bit quicker and not fall over. Now let's talk about the SB165 on the downhill, which is obviously the fun part. It is a little bit surprising here because it has the most travel and it has the slackest geometry out of any Yeti, yet the handling and the overall ride quality is a little bit serious than some of Yeti's other bikes, namely the SB160. Part of that is due to the suspension feel, and I think a large portion comes down to the geometry and the mixed wheel setup. So let's start with the differences in suspension feel. I'm approaching this from the perspective of someone who's owned and ridden the SB160 for the last year. And I've tried a bunch of different shocks on that bike. I've done the X2, I've done the Vivid, I've done the Super Deluxe Coil, and I did three different springs on that shock. I spent a lot of time getting the suspension dialed, and it is very dialed. It feels very nice currently. That said, it took me one ride on the SB165 to get the suspension feeling dialed. It's just a little bit easier going and friendlier. It's a more approachable design. I think the suspension is just a little bit softer overall and a little bit easier to get into, especially off the top. It feels pretty different there. There's still plenty of mid-stroke support and plenty of ramp up 
for bottom mount control. While that maybe means it's not quite as fast as the SB160, it certainly makes it a little bit easier to get along with. Think less race and more fun. The geometry also makes a difference, and it, it's a subtle difference, but it's noticeable. And it's the combination of the reach being a little bit shorter, the back end being a little bit shorter, and the front end being a little bit taller. And I like that the front end's taller because I'm a tall guy, and at some point I run out of stem spacers and or can't get my bars with bigger than a 40 millimeter rise, really. So this helps me get that front end a little bit taller, which has a pretty big impact on how the bike handles in steep terrain and in the rough. That front end is up higher. You got a little bit less weight on it, and you don't feel like you're going out the front door the entire time. Front end that gets too tall though can have some negative effects like a light front end in the corners so you're washing out under steering or on the climbs you're falling off the back of the bike. The SP165 did not go that tall. It is still actually on the shorter end for the category but on the taller end for Yeti. So now let's talk about that MX setup on the descents. We've got some pros and cons. So let's start with the good stuff. It is very apparent in the corners. That back end whips around quickly and it's a big contributor to the fun factor in the SB165. I think it's a big reason why this bike feels a lot less serious than the SB160. It makes it more fun in the air. It's also really nice on drops, especially for short folks who experience a little bit of butt buzz. I don't know the first thing about that, but I hear short folks complain about it sometimes. What I don't like about it is the reduction in traction. If only I could have my cake and eat it too, because I love the handling benefits of the MX setup. I just wish it had the same traction. It's a 29 inch setup. I found myself getting a bit more sidewaysier than I'd like at times. That said, the place where I noticed it the most is pretty gross. It's loose, it's shaly, it's steep, and most bikes get pretty sideways. But on this one, I did notice that back end wanting to be in front of me just a little bit more than normal. And that's a little bit disconcerting at times. That said, I didn't notice much of a reduction in traction in the corners. It was just on the steep, skiddy, braking sections of trail. So. I wonder if anybody's done the science or if anybody wants to, it'd be cool to see the difference in traction in braking versus cornering with different wheel sizes. So now let's talk about a couple of comparisons. One we've been talking about, the SB160. These bikes are similar, but pretty different. The fit, feel, overall ride quality are rather similar when you look at them in the big picture, but the SB165 has an easier to get along with suspension platform than the SB160. It's softer off the top and a bit more active. It might not be designed to generate maximum speed, but it is designed to generate maximum fun and minimize ankle pain. The SB165 rides a bit more upright with a more casual and friendly fit. If I had aspirations of racing, SB160 all day. If I just wanna ride my bike and show my friends the cool stunts I can do, SB165. Let's talk about this versus the Rocky Mountain Altitude. And today's bike is the top secret bike from yesterday's bike. Don't make me pick between these two because I've had a hell of a time riding them back to back and I cannot decide. I cannot help but think that the Yeti is the better climber and potentially the more balanced overall bike, but the Rocky is the more fun descender. So we will probably have to do a full showdown here, mostly because I wanna keep riding these bikes. Now the 165 versus the Mega Tower. I know the Nomad would be the obvious comparison here, but damn it, I haven't ridden a Nomad yet. So Mega Tower it is. Stop complaining. So comparing the Mega Tower to the SB160, the 160 was quite a bit firmer and sportier and racier than the Mega Tower, but now the 165 is starting to get a lot closer to how that Mega Tower rides, especially in terms of the suspension feel. It has that easy to get into feeling that offers a bit more comfort and give, just like the Mega Tower. And just like the Mega Tower, it lends itself to a more fun and playful riding style. So who's the SB165 for? I see it for two groups, but they kind of maybe just boil down into one group. I see it as a great option for the free ride folks, not necessarily just the folks pushing their bikes to the top of the rampage site or shuttling flying monkey every day, more for folks who do that, but also ride big burly gnarly stuff, but they're not really interested in racing. They still end up pedaling. That's kind of the free ride crowd I'm talking about. This bike is more versatile than just a push up the hill or shuttle bike because it pedals pretty well for a big bike. So maybe the better way to describe it is by calling it an enduro bike, but not an enduro race bike. It will be up for any sort of downhill you can throw at it, but it's not a one trick pony that's only good for massive jumps and super sketchy descents. It's also good on smoother, flowy terrain and those big exploratory rides and just your weeknight laps at the local. So if you like a wide variety of trails, riding styles and terrain, but lean towards the more difficult side of things when it comes to trails, I think you'd really like the SB165. 
I am also a big fan of this bike for people like me. Maybe I'm getting old, turning into that weird dad who rides weird bikes, but I find myself liking easier going suspension these days. I'm not necessarily slowing down, taking it easier, or riding any different. If anything, I'm going faster due to the hair loss. Maybe I'm just maturing and realizing that softer suspension can feel pretty nice on the old back and ankles. And sure, that might not make me sound as tough as people half my size putting 140 PSI in their forks because they just ride too damn hard, but it sure as hell is better than beating myself up for a couple of milliseconds and a handful of internet points. So there you have it. If you like bikes that ride nice, go plenty fast, corner on rails and climb a little bit better than you'd expect, go ahead, snag an SB165, you won't regret it. But then go grab yourself a tub of Icy Hot because if you're like me, you're gonna need it. Thanks for sticking around, we'll see you next time.